jobs go away, new jobs get created, many jobs just get more efficient. I don't think anyone knows exactly how fast this is going to go, but it feels like it could be pretty fast. Something huge just went down on Capitol Hill. Big tech leaders, including Sam Altman from OpenAI, stood in front of the U.S. Senate to talk about AI's explosive rise and what it means for America's future. This isn't sci-fi anymore. This is real. Altman dropped a powerful idea. AI could change the world even more than the Internet did. And his message was clear. America needs to lead this revolution or risk getting left behind. In this video, I'm breaking down everything Altman said in his opening statement. We'll uncover why this moment matters, what it tells us about where AI is heading, and why the race for control is already on. Quick heads up before we jump in. If you want to stay ahead in the world of AI and tech, smash that like button and subscribe to the channel. Let's go. What happened with the internet, we have happened again. I believe this will be at least as big as the internet, maybe bigger. Um, that needs to happen. For that to happen, investment in infrastructure is critical. I believe the next decade will be about abundant intelligence and abundant energy. Um, making sure that those that America leads in both of those, that we are able to usher in these dual revolutions that will change the world we live in, I think in incredibly positive ways, is critical. I got to go to Abilene, Texas yesterday, uh, where we're build, building out what will be the largest AI training facility in the world. It's coming along beautifully. Uh, super exciting to see. We need a lot more of that. There's a whole sort of AI factory, like a supply chain of energy chips, standing up data centers, building the racks and more. We've got to do that really well in the U.S. so that we can continue to innovate, continue to lead, um, and continue to sort of shape this revolution. In the first clip, Altman made one thing clear. Building AI isn't just about code. It's about the whole system. Chips, energy, talent, knowledge. All these pieces connect. If one part lags, the whole machine slows down. And here's the kicker. Other countries aren't waiting. Unlike something like nuclear tech, which is tightly controlled, anyone can build AI. That means the U.S. has to fight hard to stay on top, not just in brains, but in every part of the system. Now let's get serious. The global AI race is heating up and China is not far behind. In fact, they're pushing hard. Just recently, NVIDIA's CEO confirmed it. China is not falling behind at all. Nearly a quarter of the world's top AI researchers are Chinese. They're building world-class models and they're not slowing down. So if the U.S. wants to win this race, it can't afford to take its foot off the gas. So what I hear there is, is something pretty similar to, to uh, the races we've won before. Uh, nuclear energy, for example, you know, the, the Germans and Austrians really led the innovation around that. But we won the race because we, we put a massive government effort collaborating with our universities and others to win that race. Uh, Space, you know, the Soviets put the first satellite up, put, put, the first, put the first man in space, but we won the space race because we adopted a framework to ensure that we won. Um, aviation, automobiles, etc. So what I, what I hear from you is, is you, you do need support from our government, but you also need the government to stay out of your way so you can innovate and win this race. How do we incentivize companies to do business here in America to make sure we win this race in America and America leads not just China, but other non-state actors too. I mean, I think that the scariest thing about AI from a capability standpoint is it doesn't have to be a state actor to win this race. It's not like nuclear energy. It's not like space technology. I mean, this, a non-state actor could just as easily win this race and wield more power than, than anyone else. So how do we encourage innovators investment to happen here in America to ensure we win this race? Mr. Allman, you want to start? We were honored to announce back in January uh, Project Stargate, a $500 billion investment in United States infrastructure. Uh, that is now well underway, as I mentioned, getting to see it yesterday in Abilene. Uh, the first site was incredible. We need a lot more of that. We need uh, certainty on the ability to build out this entire supply chain, build the data centers, permit the electricity. We'd love to bring chip production here, network production here, server rack production here. Um, and I think the world does want to invest. We have uh, a lot of global investment flowing into the U.S. to do this. We also want to make sure that other countries are able to build with our technology, use our models, um, and sort of like be in our orbit and, and you know use U.S. diffusion of technology here. So that's really important. Uh, we need to make sure that the highest skilled researchers that want to come work at U.S. companies can come here and do that. Uh, we need to we need to make sure that companies like OpenAI and others have 
legal clarity on how we're going to operate. Of course, there will be rules. Of course, there need to be some guardrails. This is a, a very impactful technology, but we need to be able to be competitive globally. We need to be able to train. We need to be able to understand how we're going to offer services and sort of where the rules of the road are going to be. Uh, so clarity there, and, and I think an approach like the internet, which did lead to flourishing uh, of this country in a, in a very big way, we need that again. Here's something most people don't think about, and honestly, they might not even care, but it's becoming more important every day. AI and privacy. It's a little different than you might expect. See, most users actually give away their data for free when they use AI tools like ChatGPT. And guess what happens to that info? A lot of the time, it's used to train the models all over again. So yeah, privacy should matter, but it really depends on who's handling your data. Companies like Meta, not exactly known for playing nice with personal info. And here, another twist. As AI-generated content floods the internet, real human data is getting harder to find. That's what some call the dead internet theory, a web full of bots pretending to be people. And that scarcity could become a big problem. That's why this conversation around data and control, it's only going to get bigger. And I was gonna ask you, Mr. Altman, how can we provide consumers with more control over how their data is used by AI companies while preserving the utility of the AI system? So how do you get more privacy and still get the benefits? So there's all of the standard privacy controls that companies like ours and others build and should, but there's a new area that I'd love to flag for your consideration, which is people are sharing more information with AI systems than I think they have with previous generations of technology. And the maximum utility of these systems happens when the model can get very personalized to you. Um, so this is a wonderful thing and we should find a way to enable it. But the, the fact that these AI systems will get to know you over the course of your life so well, I think presents a new challenge and level of importance for how we think about privacy in the world of AI, how we're gonna think about guaranteeing people privacy when they talk to an AI system about whatever's happening in their lives, how we make sure that when one system connects to another, it shares the appropriate information and doesn't share other information and that users are in control of that. Um, I, I believe this will become one of the most important issues with AI in the coming years as people come to integrate this technology more into their lives. And I think it is a, a great area for you all to. Now let's talk about one of the biggest issues, even if most people didn't want to hear it back then. AI is about to completely flip the job market upside down. During the hearing, Sam Altman was asked straight up, yeah, AI is moving fast, but what happens to all the jobs? His answer, jobs will change. And sure, that's true. But the deeper question still hangs in the air. What happens to society when AI takes over most tasks? After showing that clip, I want to bring in someone with serious street cred, someone who used to work at OpenAI, and his take, shockingly honest. Because when you strip everything away, the truth is nobody has a perfect answer for how we keep society running when machines do almost everything. The future of work isn't just changing. It might be disappearing and reappearing in a whole new form. So talk to me about how you believe uh, leaders in, in your industry uh, can help mitigate job losses or, or uh, uh, deal with what could, as you described it last year, a uh, major social disruption. The the, the thing that I think is different this time than previous technological revolutions is the potential speed. Uh, technology, technological revolutions have impacted jobs and the economy for a long time. Mm -hmm. Some jobs go away, some new jobs get created, many jobs just get more efficient and people are able to do more and earn more money and create more and that's great. Um, yeah. Over some period of time, uh, society can adapt to a huge amount of job change and you can look at the last couple of centuries and see how much that's happened. I don't know, I don't think anyone knows exactly how fast this is going to go, but it feels like it could be pretty fast. Um, the most important thing, or one of the most important things I think we can do is to put tools in the hands of people early. We have a principle that we call iterative deployment. We want people to be getting used to this technology as it's developed. We've been doing this now for almost five years since our first product launch. Um, as, as society and this technology co-evolve, putting great capable tools in the hands of a lot of people and letting them figure out the new things that they're going to do and create for each other and come up with um, and provide sort of value back to the world on top of this new building block we have and the, the sort of scaffolding of, of society. Uh, that is, I think, the best thing we can do uh, as OpenAI and as our industry 
to be a sort of help smooth this transition. The idea we want to get to a point where AI isn't displacing uh, work, but actually enhancing work, that people are more productive and doing things that we probably can't even imagine what people will do. If we look 100 years ago, we have jobs that no one you, dreamed you can't imagine. Occur. And I don't think we can imagine the jobs on the other side of this. But, but even if you look today at what's happening with programming, which I'll pick because it's sort of my background and near and dear to my heart, um, what it means to be a programmer and, a, and you know, an effective programmer and in May of 2025 is very different than uh, what it meant last time I was here in May of 2023. These tools have really changed what a programmer is capable of, the amount of code and software that the world is going to get. And it's not like people don't hire software engineers anymore. Right. It's, they work in a different way and they're way more productive. Now here, where Sam Altman really leans in and shows the full scale of what AI could do to reshape our future. And let me tell you, this isn't hype. Every single day I'm seeing new research, wild DMOS, shocking breakthroughs. The pace is insane. And honestly, if anything, AI is underhyped. What's coming could change absolutely everything. We're not just talking about smarter apps or faster searches. We're talking about a total shift in how the world works. I am incredibly excited about the rate of progress, but I also am cautious and uh, I would say like... I don't know. I feel small next to it or something. I think this is beyond something that we all fully yet understand where it's going to go. Uh, this is, this is, I, I believe, uh, among the biggest, maybe it'll turn out to be the biggest technological revolutions humanity will have ever produced. And I, I feel privileged to be here. Uh, I feel curious and interested in what's going to happen. Um, but I do think things are going to change quite substantially. I, I think humans have a wonderful ability to adapt and things that seem amazing will become the new normal very quickly. Uh, we'll figure out how to use these tools to just do things we could never do before. And I think it will be quite extraordinary. But these are going to be tools that are capable of things that we can't quite wrap our heads around. And some people call that, you, you know, as these tools start helping us to create next and future iterations, some people call that singularity, some people call that the takeoff, whatever it is, it feels like a sort of new era of human history. And I think it's tremendously exciting that we get to live through that and we can make it a wonderful thing, but we've got to approach it with humility and some caution. Finally, we get some real insight into OpenAI's strategy around open source models. Because let's face it, things are heating up. With players like DeepSeek shaking up the game, competition in the AI space is getting fierce. So where does OpenAI stand in all this? That's what this part breaks down, and trust me, it's a key piece of the puzzle as the global AI battle rolls on. Very helpful, thank you. Now, Mr. Altman, much has been made about the Chinese open source models like DeepSeek. Uh, we spoke about that a month or two ago. Uh, a concern that I have is that accessible Chinese models promoted by the Chinese Communist Party might be an attractive option for AI application developers to build on top of, uh, particularly in developing world economies. So how important is U.S. leadership in either open, open source or closed AI models? I think it's quite important to lead in both. Uh, we realize that we, OpenAI, can do more to help here. So we're going to release an open source model that we believe will be the leading model this summer uh, because we want people to build on the U.S. stack. In terms of closed source models, a lot of the world uses our technology and the technology of our colleagues. We think we're in good shape there. Thanks for watching. As always, I'll catch you in the next one.